good to be with you this morning. We are continuing in our series, uh, the Miracles series. We've been looking at different miracles uh, that Jesus uh, did. And um, one of the things, the main thing that I, I want, I hope that we're getting across, I hope that this series is, is helping us understand, is that this same Jesus that we've been talking about throughout this series is still alive and well. It's not just we read this Bible and we say, oh, well, yeah, he did a lot of good things back then. I mean, he still does them today. Uh, sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our, our heads around and, and even maybe agree sometimes with how our life is going or whatever, but the reality is this same Jesus is, is still alive and well today in all of us. And the second thing I hope uh, that, that we, uh, we see and understand is that miracles still happen today because if we're all honest and we look deep, um, we're a miracle. God plucked us out of whatever mess we were in, or maybe not even a mess, just living a sinful life uh, and, and not uh, in a relationship with Him. He chose us, and we become that miracle. We become that miracle. The more and more I think about all my, my friends in high school and those people that I hung out with, and when I went back for a, a class reunion, I, I was I was writing this some of these sermons and thinking about miracles. I realized that what they were seeing was a miracle because I, I didn't have a relationship with Christ in high school. I, I was anything but Christ-like. We'll just leave it at that, okay? Uh, and so when they see me, they see something. They see what God has done in me and through me. They can't believe it. They always say, "There's no way you you're a pastor." Oh well, I know, but I am. Uh, God chose me, and, 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 and that's what we're doing, and, and then they'll come back to me. Uh, I remember one time we were, we were you know, having the, having the uh, mixer, and they would go to the bar, and they would get something to drink, and they would come back. You're a, you're a, you're a what? I'm, I'm a pastor, still a pastor. That first drink, I was a pastor. That second drink, I was a pastor. That, you're going to come back at the third one. I'm still going to be the pastor. They just, they just have a hard time grasping that, that, the concept. But I hope that we realize that th these miracles that, that we read about, miracles still happen. We're a miracle. And, and we become miracles to other people that God does and, and uses in us. And so uh, I, I hope that, we're, that this, this series is helping convey that. So before we jump in this morning, uh, let, let's pray together and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump into this passage. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you're a God who never gives up on us. You're a God of, of second and third and fourth chances, and there's nothing else that satisfies in this world but you. And Father, help us as we, as we jump into this miracle, uh, and many of us are familiar with this miracle, Father, help us to, to recognize your handiwork in our lives. Bless us as we study. Father, I pray that your word just jumps out of the page into our hearts, into our lives. And it challenges us, Father, to recognize all the things in our life that you do. We pray this all in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. I, I love that passage, Curtis, that you talked about during communion because I'm going to use a word here. Ready for this? It dovetails. Isn't that a great word? I mean, all the stuff that he does, if you're not familiar with you know, contractor work, dovetail is an important Am I right? Dovetail is an important word. Uh, so not only it, it does, does Jesus mold and shape us, and there, there's things that dovetail well. And, and we're, we're going to talk about this passage this morning that many of us are familiar with. Some of us may not, and that's what I love about my job because I can take God's Word and I can bring it, hopefully bring it to life in such a way that maybe you see this, maybe you've heard this uh, story before, but it, it's, it's different. Maybe if you've never heard this story before, it's new, and, and, and it makes sense to you when you read it. But we're going to be looking at the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And uh, 
man, this is a this, this is a great, great story. Probably one of the more more favorite uh, miracles of, of mine that Jesus does. But if you have your Bible, let's turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew's in the New Testament. Matthew is uh, the very first book of the Gospels. Gospel is a is kind of a fancy word for the great news of Jesus. All that all the good news stuff that Jesus has done. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the pew back in front of you. You can grab one of those. You can follow along with us. If you don't have a Bible at home. Take that Bible home with you. We'll replace it. It's no big deal. Uh, we, want, we hold the Bible, we hold God's Word in high regard here, and so we want you uh, to, to have one, be able to, to, to dive in and to read. But it's, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 14, and uh, um, for those of you that maybe are, are, are new and maybe not knowing how or where to find a, a passage of Scripture, this, I was a children's pastor when I first started and, and I noticed that some of the kids were having a hard time. So I would say, Big 14, because when you look at a Bible, all the chapters are in big, they're bold. So Big 14, we're going to be looking at little 13 through 21, okay? So uh, that's a pretty easy way to find it. But let, let's follow along. Uh, when I read this, this is the Jesus feeding the 5,000. It begins like this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds, of course, followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd catch this, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, <laughs> you got to love the disciples, but I digress. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late, send the crowds away so that they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. Listen to what Jesus, how Jesus replies here. Jesus replied, verse 16, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Baffles the disciples, by the way. Verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Basically, paraphrased, how in the world are we going to be able to feed them? We don't have any food. It gets, it gets better. Ready? Verse 18, bring them here to me, the, the loaves and the fish, by the way, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who, were, who, who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children now, there's a lot of things that we take away from the, that passage when, when we read it if we've read it on our own there are certain things that pop out one of the main things that pops out is that we see jesus feeds five thousand, but it's just the men over and above that was women and children we're gonna we're gonna talk about all this though today this miracle to me has three significant realizations and i think it's important for us to see in our own personal walk with christ so let's get to the first realization it's this what we see is this first realization that we see is jesus provides now, let me talk about this for for just a few minutes the very first thing when we read this right off the bat we see that jesus provides healing look at verse 14 okay it says in verse 14 of chapter 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. First, first off, very, very first thing, verse 14 says that Jesus had compassion on them. Okay, you think, okay, okay, this is Jesus, big deal, right? But wait, the very first thing that Jesus provides here is, ready? He provides for their heart. And you're like, Wait, how do you see that in there? Here's why. You've heard me talk about this word before. It's the Greek word, splunknizomai. I love this word. Say it with me, splunknizomai. Now you just spoke, oh, you got to say it better than that. Splunknizomai. Now you speak in Greek, right? Now you know a new language. You know one word in the new language, but you know a new language. This is that, that deep down, you know, when you, when, when you have that, that gut feeling or, or uh, that, that, that you, you feel something for someone else, that's splunknizomai. Some people say, I felt it in my heart or I, I just felt compelled to help them. That's splunknizomai. It's deep. It, it, it compels you not to just go, oh, I, sorry for them. It's deeper than that. It, 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 it gives you something to work from, all right? So we see this word. It's this word compassion. And, and this word 
literally when translated into English means to have sympathy for. To have sympathy for. You ever heard someone say this? It does my heart good to see you. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've said that. That's this idea here. This idea of, of, of uh, feeling good about doing something or feeling sorrowful or sympathy for someone or something. This is what happens when Jesus steps out of the boat. He has this mm, moment. I can't explain it. You're laughing. And, you, and rightfully so, rightfully so. I can't explain it. It's, a, mm, it's just, you know it, right? You feel it. Jesus has that moment here when he gets out of the boat. He has a sympathy for people. And here he provides for their heart. It does them good to see Jesus. And we know this. Why? Because they followed him all the way around the lake just to be there when he got to the other side and he got out of the boat. They needed to see him. It did their heart good. So we see, first off, that Jesus, he, he provides for their heart. Second, we see Scripture says that Jesus not only provides for their heart, but he heals their sick. He heals their sick. Because of his compassion or sympathy for them, he heals them. So he provides for their health. So he provides for their heart. Now he provides for their health. Look at uh, verse 19. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. He, then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. What do we see here? Jesus, in verse 19, Jesus it tells us that Jesus feeds them. So now he, he provides for the heart, he provides for their health, now he provides for their hunger. It's late. And the disciples know it. I love what the disciples do. Jesus send them away. They're not wrong in, in, in saying that. We're going to talk about that. But, but he leaves. Jesus provides for their every need. He provides for their heart, for their health, for their hunger. He leaves nothing unturned. Maybe you've heard the phrase, Jehovah Jireh. Maybe, that's, maybe that, you've never heard that phrase before. But that phrase, Jehovah Jireh, means God provides. Jesus provides. Jesus is their provider. Nothing else. I mean, Jesus tells them, you don't have to send them away, you, you feed them. And it, and it blows them away. So, so the second realization that we see here is Jesus satisfies. Look at, listen to what takes place here at the end of this miracle in verses 20 and 21. It says, they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, I'm intrigued by the very first statement we read in verse 20. It says, they all ate and were satisfied. Now, let me help us understand this word. The word satisfied in the Greek means something that, in my opinion, our English counterpart just doesn't measure up to. Let me help you, help us try to understand this. The, the word satisfied, are you ready for this, means gorge. means gorge. Okay? When you, when you hear the word gorge, you think of maybe an uncomfortable feeling. Maybe you, you know, you've ate a bunch of turkey on Christmas or on Thanksgiving Day, and you maybe ate too much of that you know, salad that you love that your grandmother or your aunt makes or your mom makes or maybe you make or maybe your, your wife makes, whatever. And you've eaten too much, and it's that, that moment where you're, you're, you're going, oh man, I ate too much, but it tasted so good, right? That gorged feeling. So this word satisfied that gives us this idea, that's what it means, but I, but I think there are better words used in the, the English language that, that give us maybe a, a little bit better painting of this picture here. Words like stuffed or full, I, I can't eat another bite, we've said those things. We, we often don't say I'm gorged. We do say, I, I, I ate too much, I can't eat another bite, I'm stuffed, I'm full. But the idea here is, is that they had more than their fill. They had more than their fill. They, they ate more than, than, than needed. They, they were taken care of. Now, on Thanksgiving dinner, if, if, if you're like most households, you've eaten way too much food, and your, your grandmother, your mom, your, whoever is hosting, says, oh, go back and get some more. 
and you walk into the kitchen, and there's still more food. There's plenty of leftovers. And then you get ready to leave, and grandma or mom or someone's filling up a bag full of leftover turkey and says, here, take this with you. And you're thinking, I, I can't eat another bite. And where does it go? It goes in the refrigerator. What? Usually never to be eaten again, right? That's what we see here. It's like you, you get this, and if you're like our house, it's like, is a 16-pound turkey going to be enough? Is a 12-pound? What do we need to get? And we always get way too much turkey, which is a good thing, right? But we get way too much turkey, and there's tons of leftovers. And then you're coming up with trying to re- figure out a recipe. You ladies, you know what I'm talking about. You know, turkey tetrazzini and turkey soup and all, you know, all these things. Mm. You're like, mm no. That's what happens here. There's so much left over. They're picking up all the pieces. They're, you know, they're not sending it home in baggies with the, with the people that came. The disciples aren't bagging it up and sending it away. But, but it's the idea. There's so much left over. There was plenty to go around. It says, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. No one went away, what? Hungry. Why? Because Jesus satisfies. Jesus satisfies. He, he, he not only provides for their, 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 their health and, and their heart and their hunger, he, 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 he satisfies everything, their longing, everything they need. But I want us to notice the significance of the sequences of events. He has compassion on them. We read right out in verse 14, he heals their heart, he takes care of their sick, so he heals the body, he provides their food, he heals their hunger. All of these things culminate in, catch this, being satisfied. Did you, did you catch that? Notice what it says here in verse, uh, in verse 20. They all ate and were satisfied notice it doesn't say they were satisfied in the beginning part of this he does all of this so there's a sequence to all of this and after all of that was done they were left wanting nothing because jesus was satisfied jesus satisfies jesus is the complete package he and only him can satisfy nothing else can even come close. And I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you're li- in your life where you've tried different things, you've tried this, you've tried that, and you think, oh, if, if I just had a better job, or, or if I could just do this, or I could just fill in the blank, I'd be able to make it. The problem is, is that we're trying all these things without putting Jesus in his rightful perspective place and allowing him to satisfy instead of trying for us to do the things to satisfy us. You see, what did the disciples want? They decided they wanted Jesus to send them away so that they could be satisfied. And Jesus is teaching them a lesson here. He's helping them understand that only He can satisfy. He gives them the opportunity to help them point those folks to Jesus, but they miss it. How many times in our life and our walk do we just miss it? God provides those opportunities. They're right there. And we go, yeah, i got better things to do. And we turn around and we walk away and we miss it. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. You're not, you're not a bad person. You're not a bad Christian. It's just we've got to tune in to what God is doing in our lives. Understanding that the same Jesus that satisfies us and all of our longings and all of our needs is the very same Jesus we should be pointing others to because he can satisfy them as well. Okay? Jesus is enough. That's the third realization. Jesus is enough. Notice the dialogue it takes, 15 through 18. Look at what it says. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages, buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You, have, you give them something to eat. And then they respond, we, we have here only five loaves and, uh, of bread and two fish. Jesus said, bring them here to me. First, we see the disciples asking Jesus to send the crowds away. And I get it. I, I get it. I've, I've, I've been there. The disciples are tired. They're worn out. Pe- people, you know, it's okay. People, people can make you tired. Being around people, helping people, they, it, it's okay. They make, they make you tired. Right. They, they, you're worn out. 
Constant crowds. I mean, can you imagine them? Everywhere they turn. Jesus goes to a solitary place. He finds solace in a boat going across the lake. And they land on the other side and boom, there's people. They try to get away. They go into a town. Boom, there's people. I, I get it. The, the, these disciples are worn out. The constant crowds. They're, they're want, the, the wanting, the begging, the needing. They just want to have some time to themselves. And so they ask Jesus, send them away. Please send them away. And this is where Jesus, boom, hits them. He asks them to feed them, but they're not catching on. Maybe they're too tired. Maybe they just don't see it. But Jesus is teaching them that while they can't catch this, He can. He can. This is going to come in, in, in handy after He leaves them. He's trying to help them understand, and they're not catching it. You know, they think, for the most part, they think that Jesus is, is this political figure that's going to come in and going to wreak havoc and going to set them free, and he's always going to be there with them. But he's trying to help them understand, I'm not going to be there. You need to understand, you can do this. You can feed them. You can be that. Point them to me. So he's teaching them, giving them this idea. But we see something here. We see Jesus tell them this. In verse 18, bring them here to me. He's talking about the, the loaves and the fish. See, because the disciples miss it, he shows them. He reminds them that he is enough. He's showing them that all they need is him. No matter the problem, no matter where they are, no matter who they're with, he is enough. As long as we have Jesus, folks, and we do, then we have all that we need. I need us to hear that this morning, because we're going to start a series in August, and this was prompted by a political cartoon that I had seen. I know, I, 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 don't, I try to stay away from that stuff, but I was, I was reading this, and this, at the bottom of this article was this political cartoon, and it was related about all the things that were going on in, in the world since January, maybe even before January, but, but since January, and it's a group of people that are hiding behind a wall, and they've got a long stick. And on the, around the corner, around this wall, is a door that says July. And they're poking the door to see what's next, what's going to hit them, right? And so I'm going to do a series called What Next? our response to what's happening in our world. And so it's important for us right here, right now, before we jump into that, and we're still two weeks away from it, before we jump into that series to understand that if we have Jesus, and we do, He's all we need. Because we're about to get into something, and the world, who knows what the world's going to be, who knows where the world's going to be. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to scare us, I'm just trying to help us be ready. We have all we need right now. Okay, let's get ready. Here we go. He is all we need, no matter what. So, <laughs> here we go. I'm going to ask some tough questions here. We could all answer pretty quickly a resounding yes to the first two points of this message. We, does Jesus provide? Yes, amen. Right? Second, pat, second, second point, does Jesus satisfy? Yes, amen. We're all, we're all about that. We're all ready to, but here's the next question. When we get to this last point, things become a little bit different. Is Jesus enough? This initial question brings about, frankly, sorry, a response of very quickly, yes. But let me take it a little further. Let me go a little deeper with this. Because I have a feeling over the next few months, as we get back into school, as things begin to potentially unravel, there's some, some of our faith is going to be tested pretty heavily. And so this is the question. If you lose everything, and I, again, I'm not trying to scare us, but if you lose everything, if everything that you tie your identity to is stripped away, everything 
and you are left with, all you're left with is your relationship with Christ, and your identity is simply this, His child. Not a husband, not a mom, not a dad. You're just simply, everything's stripped away, and you are simply identified as His child. Is that enough? Is that enough? Because the reality is, does being His child complete you? We look for everything else. We look for a lot of things to complete us in this world. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying uh, you guys are doing this. I'm saying we do this. As your pastor, I look for a lot of things other than what I should be looking for to complete me. My wife, my children, my son, paramedic student. Wow, you know, hey, let's live through him. I wanted to be a doctor. He's a paramedic. I let, let me just live vicariously through him. Boom right? If all of that's stripped away, is being Jesus' son enough? You see, because we're going to go through a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to scare us, but let me put it another way. If you become Job in the story of Job, we're familiar with that story. We, if you become Job in the middle of, of all of this and you lost everything but God, would he be enough? Is Jesus enough? Uh, and, and, and here's the, the reality. Only you can answer that question. I can't answer that question for you. I have a hard enough time answering it for me. Only you can answer that question. But if he's not, if you can answer that question and say, you know, I want to say yes, but, but I, I, I don't know. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love nothing more than to have a conversation with you to help each of us understand that Jesus is enough. He's all that matters. He's the only one that can satisfy. If you need to make Jesus Lord of your life this morning, we ask you to take that opportunity. It's important. And again, I'm not scaring you. I'm not saying the world's ending tomorrow. I don't know. I just know that right now the world is a messed up place. It always has been, but it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. The only thing we have is our faith. The only thing. And the only thing that I know in the midst of all of this, you can try to get me to talk about all these different things, and I'll stay on the fence, and there's a reason. Because if it doesn't deal with Jesus, I don't want to talk about it. I can get caught up in the Facebook stuff. I can get caught up in social media. I can get caught up. And it's not that I'm trying to be mean. It's not that I'm trying to, I just, I, I just, I don't want to go back and, you know, bury my head in the sand and think nothing's happening. I just want to focus on Jesus. Because what I realize is he is the only thing that matters. Now, you can Label me. You can do all of that. I don't, I, I, whatever. That's fine. But I have to focus and put my energy and my resources into what matters most. And I have to ask myself over and over and over, is Jesus enough? If you need to spend some time in prayer, we ask you to take that opportunity. It's just so important to, more than ever, in my opinion, to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, and focus on Him and Him alone. Let's pray together. Father, thank You. Thank You that we see so much in this miracle that's, that, that's so applicable today. God, I don't know what I'd do without Your Word. I get angry and I get mad and I get, I do things that I'm not happy. But God, your word brings me back around. It grounds me, it keeps my feet steady. And Father, as we begin to go into uncharted territory, help us focus on you. Help us to ask ourselves are you enough? Father, if we can't answer that question with just you, Father, maybe we need to dive a little deeper into your word. Maybe we need to surround ourselves with people that are like-minded, that we can talk to to help us.
Father, you never created us to do life alone. You give us help. You are our help. The people that you place in our lives are there to help and encourage and strengthen us, ultimately pointing all back to you. Be with us, God. Tough question, tough challenge, Father, that you've placed before us. Father, help us to dig deep, to anchor our feet solidly on you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. out today a uh, couple of things just to, to note you'll, you'll notice out there in the foyer a little a little table VBS helpers are needed we're not signing up we're not registering for VBS quite yet it's a little, little too early but we do need some help and so you'll notice an area there that you can sign up and help I think crew leaders are needed uh, is, is one of those areas so sign up and under uh, the area that you can help with uh, if you have any questions you can call Daynette Linda can they call you or should they call Daynette you can call Linda, too, and, and she can point you in the right direction. So camp dates in, in your bulletin that we're needing drivers for, and we're needing campers taken to camp and picked up from camp, and they vary different dates. Uh, you can talk to Jason and Rhonda about that, about driving. And also, lastly, we have hospital services today in the activities room at the hospital at 4 o'clock. We'd love to have you come and join us. Uh, those, those numbers are getting uh, at the hospital are getting thin, and, and uh, a lot of them move to the to the manor. So I uh, would love to uh, to encourage them if we can, so you can be feel feel free to join us. Thank you so much. Have a great week. We'll see you right back here next Sunday.